I'm Graham Bibby, Chief Investment Officer at Partners Wealth Group, and um, I'm introducing you today to Ben Dowling, who is Portfolio Manager, Manager at Acorn. Today we're talking about the Acorn Capital Expansion 2 platform, and uh, we'll just start with a bit of an introduction from you, Ben, as to uh, uh, intro to yourself and a bit about your background. Yep, okay. Um, so thank you, Graham, and hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm uh, one of the partners at Acorn. We're uh, there's six partners in our in our business, uh, and we're a business backed uh, by Australian Unity, who own about forty percent of our business, uh, with the partnership uh, owning the rest. Uh, I've been at Acorn for going on uh, approaching nine years. Uh, and prior to Acorn, I was the head of small companies at Citigroup here in Australia. Uh, and before that, I was at Goldman Sachs uh, doing equity research for about 10 years. Um, anyway, I won't go back any further than that because I'll start to give away my age. But um, certainly uh, been uh, in this space, investing uh, and analysing companies for uh, for uh, nine on 20 years and, uh, and love the space. So uh, and just I guess we're here today to talk about uh, ASEP number two, uh, which is actually, believe it or not, our third VC uh, for uh, high net worth uh, investors and wholesale investors. And uh, yeah, we're just sort of, uh, I guess, here to, to present the opportunity and, and to talk about uh, the uh, the unlisted side of, uh, of equity markets. That's great, Ben. Well, there's a couple of questions to start off with. One is at the company level, you know, what sort of uh, company, what's the typical target company that... Um, this fund will uh, invest in and yep. uh, yeah, in particular Acorn's view of the growth and expansion stage of the company. So if we focus on that first and then maybe we back up to um, you know, the um, you know, where the overall capability of, of Acorn fits within the you know, venture capital, private equity, uh, pre-IPO and, and listed micro cap space. Um, yep, so, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll I'll introduce um, Acorn as a business and then step into that just to put some historical context around that question. Yep. So Acorn, um, well, I've been at Acorn, as I said, for uh, approaching nine years. Our business has been around since 1998. Um, we're not the most well-known uh, business out in the market, uh, and that's by choice. And the reason for that is historically our client base are superannuation funds. Uh, and so we've, we've had no need, if you like, to go out and, uh, and be on the front page of the AFR. Uh, so we've, we've run money for, uh, and we still run money today for the big industry funds uh, in this space. Uh, about uh, in 2016, uh, we sort of got tapped on the shoulder by a group who wanted us to do uh, investing for a, a high net worth individual pool. So we've expanded our client base in 2016 to start this sort of wholesale uh, part of our business. And so we and that's why I say we have three funds, because our first fund was in 2016. Our next fund uh, was in uh, we launched in August 18, which we called ASEP number one. Uh, and obviously we're talking to you about ASEP number two. Uh, we've got about 800 850 million dollars invested in this space so we're actually one of the biggest players uh, in the market uh, and again uh, you know we're probably we're certainly probably the biggest player you've never heard of that's for sure um, and uh, to, to Graham's question so in that context uh, where do we play uh, acorn as a business plays across what we call the expansion and or early and expansion phase of, of a business's development. This yellow line is the typical uh, what we call sort of maturity wave or, or, or development wave of a, of a typical business from startup over here in the far left. Typically, uh, businesses don't go to plan in their first year or two uh, and sometimes longer, uh, and then they start to gain traction and the business grows through this expansion phase to mature growth. So Acorn plays really in this expansion phase and we try to exit obviously as the business starts to mature. The businesses that we're investing in are typically uh, doing north of three million dollars of revenue. They typically have a number of clients, not just a single client, uh, and they typically have more than one product in market. And the reason we're investing is that they need additional capital to grow their business. So that might mean they need to expand a, a factory or they need to go and buy a whole bunch of uh, new machinery. Uh, or they might just need capital to fund uh, additional IT developers. So that's what we call the expansion phase of a business. 
Uh, we don't do seed startup uh, except for biotech. That's the only sector we do it, uh, and that's fairly typical in the biotech um, sector. Um, the uh, and, and so I guess what we're trying to do is to provide a business with capital to help them grow and to achieve to achieve scale. Um, we we don't do secondary sales. So if a founder wants to sell out, we typically are not buying their shares. Uh, and so it's really expansion capital, capital that a business needs to uh, to grow. So I, I hope that answers your question. So so we describe ourselves as late stage venture capital sort of early stage private equity slash uh, ASX. So Ben, is it okay if we jump in with a question? Yeah, please David, shoot. So that would mean that I guess you have the opportunity to, to make a judgment on the business's likely success and uh, because you're really coming in at the, once it sort of turned the corner from being through the startup seed phase. Yes. Um, do you see many or any businesses fail after that point? Uh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, um, yeah. This is uh, this is not without risk. Uh, that's 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 for sure. Um, what typically the way we uh, I would typically answer that question is we talk about a barbell in terms of uh, our portfolio returns, uh, and this is why it's really important to invest. If you're going to play at this end of the market, you need a diversified portfolio, and you need diversification by numbers, by business type, so the industries that they play in, uh, and also diversification via the instrument that you're investing in. And I'll come to that later in the in the deck. Um, so we, with the barbell, if you, and I'll just hypothetically, if you create a portfolio of 10 stocks, you would have one to two that would deliver a negative return. Um, pretty rarely we have something fail completely, um, as in zero. And I'll, I'll come to why that's the case later. That's through the way we structure the deals. Uh, it does happen, but it's pretty rare. So you get a, at, at one end of your barbell, you've got a couple that have de delivered negative returns. In the middle of the barbell, you've got three or four that have delivered a return that's consistent with your target. So in our instance, 20% IRR. And then you get one or two at the other end of the barbell where you might make five, 10, 20 times your money. Um, and, and that's where, and, and, and our portfolio experience is that it's the same across the venture industry where you have this sort of a spread of returns. Uh, they're not asymmetric, if you like, if you go back to uni days talking about uh, information symmetry. So the returns are not asymmetric. It's They're very much skewed to both ends. Yeah. And we just hope that the, and our track record shows over 25 years, that the the one, two or three that deliver the the, the monster returns, uh, you know, drive the, the returns of your portfolio. A lot of the times that one stock that if one of those moonshots works, it, it returns the entire value of the fund. Right. So it's almost a probability game in some respect. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, you know, we encourage, in fact, we're seeing, um, so we encourage people to invest via a structure like this rather than trying to do it themselves. Mm. Um, a, we see all the deal flow, you know, we see 700 deals a year. Um, B, we've got a big team to analyse that deal flow. Um, uh, and then see we're, we're big enough that we can create a structured portfolio to help mitigate those returns. Yep. Um, and and yeah. so we're seeing more and more sort of, uh, in fact, in this fund, we've had more uh, sort of, we'll call them ultra high net worth families come in uh, because they're, they're found trying to do it themselves at home, you know, with a single CIO is, is really difficult um, mm -hmm. to, to create, as you say, that opportunity set that enables the probability analysis. Yep, yep. Thank you. It's good. All right. Ben, before you go on, Clive, has that answered your question that you put on the chat? Yeah, thanks very much. It was like you were reading my mind. So, yes. <laughs> Thank so. lovely. Thank you. Yeah, and perhaps that's um, yeah, address the question that I also had, which is um, yeah, Acorn's edge in this area. So, you know, the um, yeah, maybe expand on that a little bit. You know, you've got the listed teams and you've been doing micro caps. So there's a natural um you know information um gathering uh, yeah you know, that you have across sectors and you know that what you see in terms of deal flow yeah so um of the 850 odd uh, i say odd because it's moving around every day at the moment with the markets um circa 850 million of uh, of funds that we manage about half of that is in the listed environment 
Uh, and for us as a business, we uh, and that's not typical of this fund, but as a as a business, we're reasonably agnostic about whether a business is private or listed. Um, we just see uh, we see it as uh, the ASX as a, as a different source of equity capital for a business uh, rather than an exit. So um, we you know we cover all sectors at Acorn. We don't just do technology. In fact, um, to jump back one slide, this is actually a pretty important slide. Um, one of our key points of difference is uh, this left-hand chart is the is the uh, the weighted average of investments done in the Australian venture industry last year. And you'll see there's a very high uh, exposure to IT and to it says financial uh, and insurance, but it's really fintech. Um, and so it's almost 80% of venture capital deployed in Australia ends up in these two sectors. And so that gives you, David, that to the question you asked before, it gives you that concentration risk. The right hand side here is the Acorn portfolios over the last couple of years. Uh, and you'll see it's a much more diversified exposure. And you've seen a lot of IT, a lot of IT focused funds are copping it in the neck at the moment because of what's happened uh, in global equity markets with the growth off trade that's occurring. Uh, we have a much, much lower exposure. Our IT exposure is, you know, it's probably only 10 or 15 percent of our overall portfolios. Uh, and that's that's actually been partly intentional because we've struggled with the valuations uh, on the tech side for the last couple of years. Uh, and you'll see you know, industrials is a space that the the rest of our, our peers just don't play in. And so there's huge opportunities in industrials. So that's a real point of difference in the portfolios that we construct. They're a lot more diversified and therefore we think have more downside protection. Sorry, back to the... You know, we, we've got an in, a proven investment capability. We've been doing it for 25 years. Our clients are institutions. You know, they're these big sort of industry super funds that you've all seen the ads. You know, we, we represent a couple of the of the bigger guys, uh, and one of the biggest, um, and have done for a number of years now. Uh, our networks are enormous because we've been doing it uh, for so long. So you know, we've we've uh, 25 years, you build up big networks, not just uh, on the investment side, but also with the corporates themselves and the people working within those corporates. So that's another key point of difference, we think. And this on the far right hand side here, and, and I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later, I'm sure uh, Graeme's going to ask the question, um, the structure that we're, not that we're proposing, the structure that we have uh, is a highly tax advantage structure, which is different to some other funds. Uh, we so there's no capital gains tax or income tax payable on the majority of the investments in this fund plus investors get a 10 percent tax offset that they can use for other tax liabilities uh, and another key uh, is acorn staff and shareholders uh, in fact we've done 12 million dollars into the fund so we're looking to raise 100 and uh, around at a minimum 12 percent of that is going to be um, you know aligned with the management and shareholders of acorn so I hope that was a long-winded answer to your question, Graham. Yes, it was, and you did lead into, yeah, particularly those tax advantages that I, I had a question on as well. So, that, you know, the, most of, I, I think the fund is guiding to, you know, minimum 65% or thereabouts, but you'd expect a, a high proportion to be in those, what, what qualifies for the government, um, you know, tax-free uh, yeah, arrangements yeah. under the so, early, early so stage Acorn, investment yeah. level. Acorn's an approved uh, provider now by the federal government and has been for since 2016 uh, for these tax structures. The, the government set it up, that was Malcolm Turnbull that set it up about 10 years ago uh, to encourage investors uh, to allocate capital to early stage businesses. And the reason for that was that it, it's the engine room of the Australian economy from an employment growth point of view. You know, Telstra aren't really hiring additional people these days, nor are the banks. They tend to uh, let people go rather than hire them. And so uh, they've offered really attractive tax incentives uh, for early stage investing. The trade-off is uh, we can't invest in resources companies, property companies or lending companies. Uh, we don't care about real estate because uh, Acorn doesn't do real estate. There's lots of great managers out there you can choose for your property exposures. Uh, but mining and lending we do do. And so what we've done is we've created a structure uh, called a, uh, well, it, uh, we, we call it the platform. But really, you need to think about it as an economic stapled security where we have uh, exposure to the um, ESV CLP, which is the tax structure, the tax sheltered structure, which just to re reiterate, no income tax, no capital gains tax, 
plus the tax offset. But we don't want to miss out if there are opportunities in resources or in lending businesses that we think we, we can easily exceed our 20% IRR. So we've put a managed trust sitting adjacent, immediately adjacent to the to the ESV CLP, and it means we can allocate in either bucket. But to Graham's question, in fund number one, 71% of the capital went into the ESV CLP. We think this time around it'll actually be pretty comfortably north of 80%. Why do we think that? Just based on the deal flow we've seen in the last 12 months, uh, in particular around lending businesses, the lending business deal flow has just died. We haven't seen anything come across our table in, uh, I'm going to say 12 months. Um, and I'm not given what's happening to the market at the moment with you know the pricing of zip money and afterpay and well block now. Um, and some of these other uh, listed uh, consumer credit exposures, uh, we won't be seeing any any deal flow on the lending side. So we're pretty comfortable, and certainly all the deal flow we have uh, on the table now uh, would sit within the ESB CLP and therefore get that tax shelter. That's great. Um, well, another aspect of the process that would be good to um, understand is you know, many um, many investors are interested in sustainability and um, yeah, the ESG approach. Um, is there a is there a particular approach that's um, undertaken by Acorn, oh. and, and how do you how do you implement that? Yeah, so um, so this is not an ESG fund, but it uses ESG principles in our investment decision. So the difference, well, I, I won't. In fact, I haven't got enough time today to talk about the difference. But so so basically, um, we use uh, ESG issues to adjust our valuations rather than blocking things out. So we increase the hurdles that some businesses need. Having said that, we do block some things out. No thermal coal, no tobacco or controversial weapons. Now, the con tobacco and controversial weapons are not really an issue in Australia, um, but certainly thermal coal is obviously a big issue. But so rest assured, those three factors will not be in the portfolio. What Acorn does and has done for a number of years is our real focus is on, on with ESG, our real focus is around governance and helping businesses improve their governance, improve board diversity, import, improve um, gender diversity in management teams. It's something we've done for 25 years. Uh, we've got databases going back that far with our institutional clients, with the super funds, who are obviously very, very focused on this. What we tend to push with these funds is, um, uh, you know, clearly we're not going to invest in businesses that are going to be um, detrimental to the environment, mainly because, A, well, A it's the right thing to do, but B, um, exiting the, those businesses is in, every day gets harder because of, I guess, the structural shift we're seeing you know, in terms of the focus on ESG. If we can help businesses get uh, a better ESG outcome, uh, and we work very hard with our boards, and I'll, I'll touch on, the, uh, on that in a minute, uh, it reduces their cost of capital and if we can reduce their cost of capital we can improve the growth and, and the exit value of these businesses and that's really we focus once we've made an investment we're focused on maximizing our exit what when you allocate money to a, a sector and a segment like uh like this sort of late stage venture it's this far right hand side that that we're really created with uh, uh, focused on and that's supporting innovation it's creating jobs, as we talked, touched on earlier. You know, the job growth that we create is is very significant with the capital that that uh, you know we manage. The, the example I like to use is uh, a, a business called Carbon Revolution, which is now ASX listed. It's it's struggling a bit as a business now, but when we invested, it had 12 employees. It's now got 450, and so you know that's you feel it makes you feel pretty good about the way you're using your capital. Um, and so for us, it's patents, it's R&D, and it's that governance piece, as I talked about, about improving governance. So, um, you know, the environmental piece is really important, but it becomes a sort of a screen for us to not invest as opposed to us chasing uh, environmental opportunities. That's great, Ben. So, you know, we've got a pretty clear picture now about, you know, where you invest um, and you know, the sustainability aspect. I, I guess the thing that everyone is interested in is, you know, performance and, um, you know, yeah. perhaps, um, you know, the first fund, ASEP 1, is a bit of a bit of a guide to uh, what to expect from ASEP 2, and including it'll be interesting to know what investments you've made already. And look, as part of our due diligence, you know, we, we go back and, you know, look at, 
and um, you've shared with us the uh, the longer track record of of uh, all the exited deals, and there's something you know, in excess of 50 companies that have been exited in this yep. in this space. So I think for us, you know, there is a track record, there is some, there, there is a distribution, but you know, what what's the expectations given the performance of ASAP One and and the current environment? So, um, right, so again, I'll just take one step back um, to contextualise the, the answer. So. Um, when we build the portfolios, uh, uh, this little screen you can see, or the, the slide I'm showing now, uh, the portfolio that we're building for ASEP number two, which is what we took the fund we're talking to you about today, is exactly the same as it was for fund number one, except there's going to be a couple of extra investments because it's a slightly bigger fund. So what we're looking to invest in is uh, private businesses, where we, this is not a pre-IPO fund. I know you would have seen a number of pre-IPO funds over the last two years. Uh, we don't really like pre-IPO and haven't done for 12 months or so. And what's happening to the market now is why we didn't like it. Having said that, the fund has the opportunity from a legal documentation point of view to do pre-IPO, but the intention is that, you know, 90 plus percent of the capital will be in, in what we call term unlisted investments, which means kind of three to four years is our average holding period for these investments. We're targeting a, an IRR after fees above 20% per annum for, for clients. It'll be, as we touched on, it'll be a diversified portfolio to, to enable that barbell type um, structure where of 15 to 20 investments. And the bit I just wanted to touch on uh, before hitting um, Graham's question is this instrument piece. And I touched on it earlier. It's a really important part of what we do, and we probably don't highlight it enough. But when we we're not just we're not just investing ordinary in ordinary shares in these businesses. Almost always, we take a preferred position. So we invest in uh, convertible notes, or we invest in convertible preference shares, where we sit at the very top of the capital stack. So if a business does not perform to expectations, and this is why we don't typically lose all of our money when something goes bad and it's it's this little bullet point here because uh, when you have a, a, a capital stack we sit at the very top with our preferred position and ordinary shareholders sit below us so what happens is when the value of the business drops our preferred position stays the same size but drops and it's the equity piece below that gets squeezed and so what that means is that you know if a business halves in value we can maintain about hundred percent of our holding Beyond that, it starts to get a bit more, you know, and that's why sometimes they do blow up completely. But it gives us an element of downside, what we call downside protection. Uh, we also have board, uh, we, we sit on the boards of about 70% of the companies that we invest in. So we're currently sitting on well over a dozen boards as a business. Uh, and, you know, that's the, the six partners I touched on earlier, the ones who are sitting on those boards, inclu including myself. Um, and we have veto and negative controls, which are really important in the shareholders agreements. So we won't invest without having some changes to the shareholders agreement that mean founders can't sell shares without our permission. They can't bring debt onto the balance sheet without our permission because those two factors change the risk profile of the investment completely, um, you know, for founder exits, for example. And so that helps, again, protect on the downside. And so with that knowledge, here's our track record. And we've broke, so we've done 63 uh, private investments over the last 20 odd years. Uh, but more importantly, we've had 39 exits. So we're, we're, uh, we joke that we're in the moving game, not the storage game. The three buckets that you see here, or three columns, are the three different client bases that we have. The far left is our institutional clients. The middle is our first VC fund. And the far right is our um, uh, fund number one, which is the sister fund to the one we're talking to you about today. Since 2009, uh, and uh, the two different numbers here, uh, I'll explain in a second, but since 2009, ESVCLP um, qualifying investments have done 39 or 38.8% per annum. The, if we include property investments and all the stuff you know, that, that we talked about that are excluded, which and property in particular, we we're not doing. Um, our return is still 33.2% um, per annum. Uh, and that's obviously, if you then put that into a tax sheltered structure, it's a pretty attractive return. You'll see there the average holding period for each investment is three and a half years. 
for fund number, our, our first VC fund, the return is lower at the moment at 25.1%, but you'll see the investment horizon is only 2.4 years. And so the longer we can hold these businesses and help improve the governance and help improve their, their strategies, we can extract more value at exit. And so, you know, we've still got another year to drag these returns up and you can see well above the 20% target. And this is the one we're really um, happy with uh, at 21%. We've only just finished investing this fund. So we did our last investment in August of last year. And so about a, third, uh, about a quarter of the portfolio is still sitting at zero uh, because we've only just finished investing and we're already at 21.6% IRR. And so again, that uh, over the next year or so, we'd ex well, we would expect that return to continue to grow. So it's, um, and again, all of these investments on both sides, well, not all, the vast majority sit within that tax sheltered structure. So, you know, on an after-tax basis, it's a pretty attractive strategy. Does that answer your question, Graham? Yeah, it does. That's really good. And we've got some questions coming through here. I'll try and sort of cover some of them and yep. uh, we'll get back to um, anyone if we're not able to get to everything. Uh, we've got about five minutes perhaps left. And um, so one, uh, it's a couple of questions. Um, one, I think, leads to the other in a way. Um, so there's the current market and the um, yeah, economic outlook yep. and um, you know what we what we see is you know the volatility global events and uh, higher interest rates and inflation you know how is that impacting opportunities and i think you know there's a natural sort of flow on to well what the investment environment now is not not going to be the investment environment when you're exiting which is going to be that three to four years expected hold period as you've mentioned yeah um, so you know perhaps a little bit about how that you know, drawdown of capital works um, and then you're deploying it and then you're harvesting and returning capital. Um, you know, that, that sort of life, you know, you've got a, you know, the overall life of the fund, the legal life of the fund, but you'd be getting um, money back well before then, I, I guess, when some of these investors, uh, investments yep. are maturing. Yep, okay. So I've got both of those. So deployment of capital and then the current market. So maybe I'll touch on the current market current, um, first. Clearly, the um, IPO market um, has died a death uh, overnight, which we were expecting. Uh, in fact, we were expecting it at some point over the last 12 months, but it's finally happened. So a lot of these pre-IPO funds uh, are going to hold investments a lot longer than they expected. But what we've been able to do is uh, we've we've done one investment already, uh, and we've got three that we'll do probably pre-30 June. Uh, two of the three that we'll do pre-30 June have been repriced through the negotiation period. Uh, Advisors and, and companies can see what's happened to the market. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So we're about to put money into a um, an advanced technology business that's been spun out of ANU. Uh, they were looking for a $150 million uh, pre-money valuation. We initially could get roughly there, but this these deals take three, four, five months to, to consummate sometimes. And so obviously the market's come down. We've now repriced that deal to 90 million, so from 150 down to 90, and the deal's still getting done. So we can move pretty quickly uh, with in, in constructing this portfolio because we're starting effectively. This fund is now starting effectively uh, with this big adjustment in the in market pricing, so that I guess favours returns. But then Graham touched on the other point: is that our holding periods are three to four years. Uh, yeah, okay, the economic cycle is going to be tough, I think, for a couple of years would be my view. Um, and uh, But that for us creates opportunity because, uh, you know, these businesses still need capital. These early stage businesses are still uh, growing like weeds, a lot of them. Um, some of that growth may come off for the next 12 months, but that gets reflected in the prices that we pay for these businesses. Um, where we talk about the drunkard's walk um, in investing. It's the old uh, two steps forward, one step back. Um, and, uh, you know, these businesses all go through that and, you know, the, I guess where we are in the cycle is going to impact that a little bit in the short term, but we're able to adjust prices, we're able to adjust the structures and the strategies. Now, if, we, if we're uncomfortable with uh, a valuation that gets struck, uh, we can do, um, in addition to a preferred return that we talked about, the convertible preference share, we can actually structure preferred liquidity. Uh, so, for example, We've just done a deal at two times preferred liquidity, which means our investors get two times their money before any other investor in the company gets a cent. So we can structure those sorts of deals when there's uncertainty around value 
Uh, and that's the benefit of being one of the biggest players in the market is that, uh, you know, when, when actually it's a point I should touch on. When we invest, we're not just investing ASEP number two capital. Alongside you is a couple of the big super funds and our other high net worth uh, client. On average, our investment check is somewhere between 10 and $15 million, of which about a third is coming out of ASEP number two. So we can structure these big deals because we're a big player, and uh, and that means you know despite the market volatility, uh, you know we, we can bring that to bear really quickly in our pricing. In terms of deployment of capital, that's another important factor in all of that. Uh, you know this chart here, Graham, on the left. Um, yep. Just to remind everyone, with this fund, you know if you if you commit say a hundred grand, which is the minimum investment, uh, we're not asking you to provide to write a check for a hundred grand tomorrow. Uh, the way we work is we draw the capital down and it's going to take three years to deploy that capital. And so that capital will sit effectively on your balance sheet until we're ready for it. Uh, and we're only going to be ready for it if there are good investment opportunities out there that are well priced. We're not raising the capital up front to then go and um, you know, effectively have to do deals. If the market really turns to hell in a handbasket, we don't have to invest the capital because we haven't drawn it. So we can sit back and wait. Uh, there's no reason we need to invest it all straight away. Um, and so with fund number one, uh, we actually, it took us three years to call the $100,000. Uh, and interestingly, we, uh, under the, one of the rules with the ESV CLP structure, the tax structure is when we sell something, we have to hand the capital back to clients straight away. We don't recycle the capital. And so that's, that's what the blue line is. That's the money coming back. Uh, from fund number one. And so we're actually handing money back on fund one before we'd finished, you know, ringing you up asking for your final uh, cut. In fact, was the final two drawdowns. So it's a, um, from a, a risk point of view and a market risk point of view, it means we can, we can sort of smooth out exposure via, uh, we can smooth out that volatility in the market. We're not deploying capital at one point of the market cycle. I think that answers your question. Yes, it does. And uh, from that graph, it's it looks like it's five years. Um, you know, when you uh, you get all the capital back that you would have um, been called, and yes, then that's right. And yep. sort of profits, uh, which then goes for another sort of couple of years. So in that case, it's sort of seven years, but it could go up to eight. I think that's that's the term, isn't it? Yeah, and and uh, but it could be earlier, right? Like, um, and fund number one, we've got one of our businesses that is. Uh, you know, we talk about the barbell, it's very much heading to that 10, 20 times money return. Uh, that could be exited a lot earlier than we're currently forecasting, which is mid next year. That could go at some point this year. And if it does, it'll return 100% of the fund. So that blue line shifts pretty aggressively to the left. So mm -hmm. if you do get a moonshot that, um, and there's an exit, because typically the exits for moonshots are trade sales, not IPOs. Um, if you get an exit, then... Um, yeah, that blue line shifts to the left, but we just do that to be conservative because that's what we think, you know, it currently looks like. So three years to invest the capital approximately, and then uh, two years later, you should get 100% of that capital back. And then there'll be a little bit of uh, some of the profit left to roll beyond that. that that's excellent. I think we've pretty much um, wrapped up um, like all the questions. There's one that's a little bit more detail on Acorn's view about green industries. I think we covered some of it in the um, in the ESG section. But is there any you know, particular industry uh, interest or I, I guess opportunities? And in, in um, yeah, so we see we obviously see a lot of deal flow in this space at the moment. Um, a lot of it tends to be too early for us. We, we, I talked earlier about the three million dollar minimum kind of revenue as a as a general rule. Um, we've, we've been doing, as a business, we've been doing a lot of investment in the rare earths and kind of EV metals and materials space, which has been great. Um, we've got, uh, we see a lot of sort of uh, wind generation businesses and uh, battery storage businesses, but a lot of those businesses don't meet our 20% minimum IRR hurdle because they, they're more sort of utility um, you know, you know, um, in, in nature. Um, we've got one business that we're looking at, in fact, sorry, one business that we've invested in that's quite interesting. It's a, uh, which is not in this fund, it'll be, it's in fund number one, which is a, uh, they make advanced heat exchanges. Um, 
which doesn't sound very green, but what it does is it, it massively improves the efficiency of cooling systems. Uh, and so therefore, uh, um, large industrial assets need less energy to, to run and, and, and um, uh, you know, to drive their assets. So that's a business um, called Conflux based down in Geelong. Um, and so they're building little, a heat exchanger is just a fancy name for a radiator. And EV cars need more radiators, believe it or not, than traditional cars because they need to keep the batteries cool. If you keep the batteries cool, then you get a lot more range and the, the batteries are more efficient. So that's the kind of a green-ish type investment. So we do do them, we see lots of them, but typically they're a bit early in their development stage for us. If we were to do an early stage fund, which we might uh, next year, then that would be the fund that would look at a lot of those green industry type opportunities. Excellent. Well, I think it's um, probably uh, good to wrap it up there. On any any other questions, please do come through. Um, talk to your talk to your advisor, and um, yeah, let us know. And from the um, in, anyone on the call, we're happy to follow up on any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Ben, and uh, thank you, Kate, for um, uh, facilitating the uh, briefing today. Thanks, Graham, and thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, any questions, you. please feel free to come through. Thanks, okay. Graham. Thank thanks, much. everyone, for attending. Thank okay, thank you. Bye.